All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to my a little slice of bandwidth here on the interweb. Hope everybody's well. Uh, today I want to take you on a little journey through the mind of a very fascinating character that I had have just became uh, become aware of, Mr. Wyndham Lewis. Uh, but before we get into the world of Wyndham Lewis and his book, The Childer Mass, I wanted to just give you a quick rundown, a couple of things that just came in that I'm reading. Uh, this book by uh, Rod Dreher, a man, uh, Live Not by Lies, a Manual for Christian Dissidents. Um, uh, Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hain, they went over this book on their podcast. I believe it was podcast number 49. Interesting stuff there, just kind of getting into that. Um, and also, apropos, I just picked up this little, this little guy here. Uh, so, uh, quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong, which is interesting. So, it's got um, beautiful par portraits, uh, and it's got writings and quotes. Look through it a little bit in Chinese, and then it's got the uh, English translation. And apparently, all peasants, all farmers, all Chinese folks had these at hand and would uh, pick them up anytime they needed a little encouragement to uh, focus, refocus themselves on the party. So interesting stuff there. Maybe I will do a little video reading some quotes out of this book um, just for some fun, right? But um, I am going to be talking about Wyndham Lewis and Wyndham Lewis came out of me reading The Medium and the Light by Mr. Marshall McLuhan. And the more I looked into this guy, the more fascinating and intriguing I was by him. He was writing this book particularly in the 1920s, 1928, I believe. And he was a modernist. He was a brilliant painter and uh, I believe a sculptor as well, but he was a political theorist. He was a philosopher and he also wrote novels. And he was writing in the style and time of the modernist of uh, uh, T.S. Eliot, Gertrude Stein, James Joyce, and he has kind of, uh, you know, scathing um, criticisms slash appreciation for these authors, and he, and he discusses them, and he, and he quotes them throughout his different works. It's very interesting and fascinating. I was thinking of him as the, um, the hyper-intellectual Alex Jones of the 1920s. Um, I was also thinking of was one of the first modern authors, people, thinkers to be canceled because he was, he is all but eliminated almost from the internet. I mean, you'll find the Wikipedia page about him. He's got several books that he wrote. You'll find pictures of his work, but he was almost universally hated by, in his time um, because he really um, criticized in a specific manner the power structure of the left and the right. He was thought of at that time as a kind of a right-wing person. And I believe he wrote a book on the uh, uh, the biography of, of Adolf Hitler. And um, he is one of those people that I wanted to share some information that I came across on because you can't find information on him almost anywhere. If you look up YouTube, Wyndham Lewis, if you look up his book, The Childer Mass, you almost find nothing. There's one talk given by a British um, professor that is hard to hear. So all of these things that I was coming across made me more intrigued to dig into this, uh, this guy and his life. He uh, was in World War II, or I mean World War I, the Great War. And as uh, he came out of that war, he started writing and he's got a lot of commentary on the war. He's got a lot of commentary on popular culture at the time. Um, he's very hard to uh, pin down and his work, which I'm going to read from uh, the book, which I could barely get. Uh, if you go try to find this book to purchase, it is very hard to find. And if you do find it, it's very expensive. And look at the shape that this came in. It's uh, first two couple pages are falling out um, and it's not in great shape, but this is a novel that he wrote and I'll get into it a little bit here. He wrote this in 1928. And if you are interested in the work of uh, Jill Deleuze, he is writing in, he kind of presupposes Jill Deleuze in the way he's thinking and writing and the way that his mind works. 
Um, he takes from so many distinct and different um, uh, dimensions of thought that it's, uh, it's, it's this book is, is quite interesting. And it's written in one, there's no chapters or breaks. And the book is about um, a, two people that find themselves in the afterlife um, or purgatory after they both died in World War I. And what they see there and how he writes about what they see there is 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 a hallucinatory it's uh interesting so we're going to read a little bit from there but first i'm going to um i'm going to read from this article yale article which is one of the only uh, a few ones that i could find about him in, in this book the childer mass uh, and i'll just get started reading here um please guys uh, like and subscribe all that fun stuff and i'm going to share here i'll see if i'm crafty enough to put the link here to the um the McLuhan chapter on Wyndham Lewis. It's fascinating. And again, I'm just intrigued and interested in this guy's mind. Uh, and reading a little bit of this book, he is presupposing a lot of things that are happening now and talks about how, you know, art is uh, an art is some is, is the way that he talks about art is very interesting and poignant for now. Uh, I wrote in my notes that he, you know, kind of like Kanye said recently in his Joe Rogan interview, I say that uh, Wyndham Lewis was existing in the future. He was visiting the past when he was writing, but he's very present in the now, right? And I think he's going to be um, uncovered and discussed and explored more. Not that, you know, I agree with his, uh, you know, perspective or echo the sentiments that he has, but I do find his thinking intriguing, interesting, and fascinating. So let's get into it here. So uh, Wyndham Lewis, The Childer Mass, 1928. The first volume of the unfinished epic, The Human Age. So that was this, um, the epic that he was writing was, this was the first volume. Um, parts two and three came out in the 50s. Again, he wrote this in 1928. Is unarguably the most radical, outlandish, and formally, formally experimental work in Lewis's Au revoir. Aptly dubbed by Frederick Jameson as, listen to this, quote, the supreme realization of what has to be called theological science fiction, close quote. Lewis's second published novel follows the adventures of two Englishmen. And this is the plot of the book I'll be reading from. Um, so pay attention a little bit because it's hard from reading the book to get your bearings of what's going on here. So the plot in the novel follows the adventures of two Englishmen, Sadler Swate and Pullman presumably killed in the Great War as they posthumously explore a weird purgatorial afterlife while awaiting admission to something called the Magnetic City. As in Tar, which is another one of his novels, Lewis in the Childermass spends a good deal of time dramatizing his theoretical, political, and aesthetic concerns, which he had been publishing post-Tar in The Art of Being Ruled, 1926, and Time and Western Man, 1927. Along the way, he produces extensive parodies of the styles of both James Joyce and Gertrude Stein, while also pushing the inimitable Lu Lewisian sentence he had developed in Tar to its extreme limits. Uh, brief note here on the plot and characterization of the Childermass. The novel begins when Sathersweight, Satters for short, newly arrived in purgatory, discovers his school day's acquaintance, Pullman, Pulley, standing before the Stygian River that runs through the landscape and contemplating the quote-unquote peons, the mysterious laborers who do what works, works need to be done in this afterworld. The early part of the novel follows the newly reunited pair as Pullman, longer resident in the land of the dead, tries to help Satters get his bearings. Satters, large, flabby, and babyish, is represented as the immature novice, emotionally needy and intellectually incompetent, while the intelligent Pullman, half-hero's nurse, half-nursery governess, must quell his own exacerbation and compassionately look after the newcomer. They wander about the wasteland with its fogs and multiple suns, its shifting mountains in the distance, its river whose course can alter without warning, and beyond all, the distant skyline of the magnetic city to which the inhabitants await entry. Here's a quote from the book here. The sheer profile of the city is intricate and uneven. Above the walls appears nascent, armorial and unreal, a high-hatched outcropping of huddled balconies, black rufous brown vermilion and white, 
the upper stages of wicker towers, helmet-like hoods of tinted stucco, tamarisks, the smargodine and olive of tropical vegetation, tinseled banners, gigantic gray, sea green and speckled cones, rising like truncated eggs from a system of profuse nests and a florid zoologic symbolism, reptilian heads of painted wood, filled out tinfoil or alloy that strike round beneath the, guest, the gusts of wind, and pigs made of inflated skins in flight, bumped and tossed by serpents among the pennants and embossed banners. The severe crests of bulky ziggurats rise here and there above the shivery of roof life perceived beyond and between the protecting walls. It is without human life, like a city after a tragic exodus. More quote here. Our peons, what was I going to say? Are the peons, Satters begins, men? No, not men. I mean, are, are they always peons? Pullman is in a huff. He moves the previous question. The dialogue prevents him from leaving. They are not always peons. Always is a big order. Once a peon, always a peon. Is that what you mean? Not necessarily. Yes, I expect sometimes they are, they are human like us, aren't they, in a way, Pulley? Not like us. Not like us? What's the difference? Are we very different? I believe we only think we're so different. Pullman is bending over his basket. I have to go to the Craddocks. It's out of bounds. What is this place, Pulley? I forgot to ask you. This? It's the city of the dead, I imagine. Can't be too sure. Close quote. More about the plot here. The most important character in the children's children mass is perhaps the landscape itself considered in terms of its effects on those doomed to traverse it in this ever shifting city of the dead the principal law is disorienting mutability objects can disappear or shift in size human inhabitants can suddenly age or become younger not to mention switch sex while roads obstinately obstinately refuse to lead today where they led the day before to top it all off, there is the troubling possibility of walking into time warps, a risk exemplified in one extended set piece when Satters and Pullman stumble into the 18th century England full of toy-sized humans going about their business. Quote, small and nimble figures are going and coming on all hands. Ostlers bring horses out of the stable. There are two large wagons full of hay, on the shafts of which miniature carters sit, muffed in banks of clothes, Legs dangling, one with a gesture of lazily cracking his whip. Close quote. It turns out that they are near, quote, the old red lion where Thomas Paine wrote his Rights of Man, close quote. And the scene turns ugly when a misbehaving Satters antagonizes Thomas Paine himself, who demands, quote, how would you like to be scragged by a giant six times your size and call Scatters a lout? In petulant revenge, Satters murders Paine, by stamping him under his boot. Pulley and Satters eventually make their way to the quote-unquote camp, a specially enclosed area in which the dangerous temporal spatial vagaries of the city of the dead have been contained and suppressed. Here the underworld's head magistrate, known as quote-unquote the bailiff, holds court in his adoring minions. Pullman among them, Satters despite the, his stupidity and immaturity remains precisely suspicious. The bailiff is, apparently, this purgatory's general ruler, a hideous, omnipotent demagogue who alternates violent displays of his enormous power with crowd-pleasing rhetoric to achieve control over the land's inhabitants. Listen to that, that quote again, right? Who does this remind you of? Um, yeah. So the bailiff is apparently this purgatory's general ruler, a, a hideous, omnipotent demagogue who alternates violent displays of his enormous power with crowd-pleasing rhetoric to achieve control over the land's inhabitants. He determines, furthermore, who can pass out of purgatory into the magnetic city. He does not operate entirely unopposed, though. The heroic and vaguely fascist Hyperides with his band of followers, or Hyperides, with his band of followers, reject the bailiff and accuse him of fraudulence and deceit. Roughly the second half of the Childer Mass follows the war of words between the bailiff and his interlocutors, while Pulley and Satters drop out for large swaths of the narrative. Perhaps signaling the dialectic character of the argument, large portions of the dialogue 
from here on out are laid on the page like a play. A dramatic and dramatic devices such as stichomythia or pointedly are pointedly employed. In other words, large sections of this novel consist formally of drama. When not appealing to the masses or sparring with the Hyperideans, Hyperideans, the bailiff spends his time evaluating his subjects for entrance into the magnetic city and quelling, sometimes with extreme violence, minor instances of dissent. The novel concludes after extensive debating between the bailiff and the Hyperideans with a kind of draw. Pulley and Satters get the novel's last page after the meeting is called to an end and both the bailiff and the Hyperdians depart, though they only use it to squabble pointlessly. Oh, they, oh, though they only use it to squabble pointlessly with one another before, presumably continuing to wander about the city of the dead. The final line of the book is from Pullman: "Step back, pick up your feet. If you must go nowhere, step out." Another book that he wrote, uh, Wyndham wrote, was uh, Time and Western Man. So this little piece is called From Time and Western Man to Children, uh, Chil Children Mass. Hugh Kenner was usefully helped, uh, Hugh K Kenner has usefully helped identify the dialectic animating the agon between the bailiff and the Hyperides, which would be obvious only to readers familiar with Lewis's Time and Western Man and The Art of Being Ruled. Put schematically and very reductively, the bailiff represents all those aspects of what Lewis calls the time cult, with its attendant impressionistic interiority and its debt to Henri, Ber his debt to Henri Bergson. Lewis wants to oppose this time cult with a violent expressionism of surfaces, as manifested by the Hyperdians, who, quote, in tumbling set speeches, anatomize with forensic hostility the cult of homosexuality, the dismemberment of the person, the apotheosis of the child, and the other themes of the art of being ruled. Close quote. Artistically productive, sterility versus sex, the lone genius versus the herd, the outside versus the inside, expressionism versus impressionism. These are the binaries according to which Lewis organizes the debate. This dialectic repeats in expanded form the tension in Tar between the misogynistic artist Tar on the one hand and his surrounding environment of bourgeois bohemianism and Freudian prurience on the other. As in Tar, although more so, self-parody attends the depiction of Hyperides' cult, a preposterous wannabe Hellenic militia whose followers assume Greek names and say things like, but independent thought bursts out. That is by reason of the demonic force of genius, you understand. Nothing else would do it. Close quote. Beyond the dramatization of these dialectics, though, the children mass most pointedly through the character of the bailiff dramatizes the pernicious eff efficacy of certain kinds of politico ideological rhetoric itself. And indeed, as Alain Munton points out, though ideas derived from time in Western man and the art of being ruled can easily be read into the children mass, such ideas quote, account for very little of the text. Monton, in one of the best readings of the novel, convincingly argues that the children mass shows what it is like to experience the demands of a ruler who pretends to be a Democrat, but is in fact a ruthless exploiter of all the means of persuasion available to him. Pullman, objective, Pullman abjectly renounces all those critical powers that the intellectual should possess. In submitting to the bailiff cult, in this reading, the Children Mass is an allegory about the dangers of authoritarian populism. Last little section here before we get into some of the reading. Quote, bless his brain weed and word fungal. Close quote. Parodies of James Joyce and Gertrude Stein. Lewis's ambivalent relationship to the literary developments of his period are well known, and the Children Mass provides some beautiful instances of his parodic energy, particularly regarding the work of Joyce. The bailiff speaks in advance to Joyce's for a good four pages, a, sam a small sample of which below. So this is a, a quote from the Children Mass, and this is the character, the bailiff, um, uh, making a caricature or um, speaking in Joycean terms. So here we go, quote. Aunt Sharon, oh joys, no John, oh dreams, but rarely pragmatical, to solemnly declare that he will nad nor after thort he wilt. For it's all one to him, seeing oral his thorts is nor after thorts for the matter that come to think. 
Ant one more nor less is all one, and he'll accommodate as many narfter tharts as never at and thereafter may come knocking. Sure, I was not dipped in Shannon for nothing, says he, and composes himself in his best foxy book for martyr's posture for the post shot, winking the while with his Nelson's optic, a cute little cyclops with his one sad water glim as he regards me as though I were some shrewd spudson and he my martyred prey. But I exercising the man's privilege to change me mind and wishing its effect no mortal harm to the stummer stammerer bless his brain weed and word fungal aims low for I wished to wing him. So I advises his understandings and I dispatched me narfter thord thus close quote. Clearly responding to the fragments of Finnegan's wake that had been coming out in the twenties in the twenties in criterion. Lewis tries to demonstrate that he too can play this game though. It's not one he thinks is worth playing. As he writes in a passage discussing Joyce in Rude Assignment in 1950, quote, Odds and ends of words or phrases were always floating about in his pockets. Joyce carried about with him from one country to another, a trunk full of such fragments, bits of paper, newspaper cuttings. The resulting book, The Wake, was too much of a patchwork of these, close quote. By... By placing his own Joycean patchwork of verbal odds and ends in the mouth of the time cultist bailiff, Lewis dramatizes what he sees as the pernicious effect of Vico, Bergson, and Freud on Joyce, Joyce's work. Joyce, after all, had been prominently featured among those writers criticized in Time and Western Man for having, quote, abandoned themselves to a disintegrating metaphysic. Close quote. Last paragraph here. Lewis was more hostile to Stein's work even than to Joyce's. Quote, Miss Stein and many like her, he writes in Rude Assignment, exponents in the creative field of the time philosophy will, three centuries hence, be recognized as what they are, the dark stammering voice of social dissolution. Close quote. He expresses his contempt for Steinian play by using her distinctive idiom to express the babyish mooling of the regressive satyrs at his most dependent, quote, Pulley has been most terribly helpful and kind. There's no excuse. There's no use excusing himself. Pulley has been most terribly helpful and kind. Most terribly helpful, and he's been kind. Close quote. For the contemporary devotee of Stein and Joyce, Lewis's idiosyncratic objections to their work, based on a set of obscure and rather politically suspect assumptions, can be irritating in the extreme. But interestingly, the parodic incorporation of their signature styles into the bustling texture of the Childermass only makes that work an even more thrillingly lively piece of writing. He may have intended to attack, but the Steinian and Joycean threads that make up a small part of Lewis's eccentric masterpiece seem now more like a tribute. Like this video is a... Uh longer than I thought it would be, but you'll see kind of why I wanted to give this introduction. So I'm going to start from the children mass. I am going to read from the back of the book um, just to give you some more context here. So the children mass, Wyndham Lewis. Wyndham Lewis is one of the most unusual literary figures of this or any century. His literary reputation has suffered in recent years from his fame as a painter, but he is undoubtedly one of the most important English writers of the century, as well as one of the most powerful and polemical propagandists in the modern movement in all the arts. In 1914, he founded the famous magazine Blast, to which all the principal painters, poets, musicians and great, uh, of the Great War contributed. Many of the most brilliant of them were killed. Wyndham Lewis remaining the central figure among the survivors, many of whom became the best-known artists of the 20s and 30s, although the movement that he founded, Vor Vorticism, never achieved the popularity of its French counterpart, Cubism, as established by Brock, Brock, Brock and Picasso. Wyndham Lewis can, in fact, be compared to Picasso as a painter and perhaps to Céline as a writer. And it is possible because his political sympathies remain to the right of fashion during the leftish, leftist 30s and 40s that his contemporary reputation is not higher. The Children Mass was first published in 1928 and is the first part of a four-volume reconstruction of a tour of the other world after death, obviously intended to parallel Dante's Divine Comedy. 
The whole work is entitled The Human Age, and later volumes will appear in the Jupiter series. The Children Mass relates how Pullman and the babyish Satterthwaite, Satters, who had been his fag at school, find themselves in a camp set in the plain within sight of the walls of the Magnet City. The two Englishmen have been killed in the war and gradually accustom themselves to their new surroundings, awaiting the moment when they will be allowed to enter the city. The force of Wyndham Lewis's imagination and his descriptions of the personalities and places that lie beyond death make this one of the most extraordinary fantastic novels of the century. All right, so we're going to read a little bit here. I'd love to know if you guys are still with me here and, and what you think, um, but let's just get started. The city lies in a plain ornamented with mountains. These appear as a fringe of crystals to the heavenly north. One minute, bronze, one minute bronze cone has a black plume of smoke. Beyond the oasis plain is the desert. The sand devils perform up to its northern and southern borders. The alluvial bench has recently gained in the celestial region upon the wall of the dunes. The pulse of Asia never ceases beating. But the outer alien element has been worsed, worsed locally by the element of the oasis. The approach of the so-called Yang Gate is over a ridge of um, pneumatic limestone. From its red crest, the city and its walls are seen as though in an isometric plane. Two miles across, a tract of mist and dust separates this ridge from the river. It is here that the shimmering obscurity, the emigrant mass, is collected within sight of the walls of the magnetic city. To the accompaniment of innumerable lowing horns along the banks of the river, a chorus of mournful messages, the day breaks. At the dully sparkling margin, their feet in the hot waves stand the watermen signaling from shore to shore. An exhausted movement disturbs the night camp stretching on either side of the highway, which, when it reaches the abrupt sides of the ridge, turns at right angles northward. Mules and oxen are being driven out of the road, like the tiny scratches of a needle upon this drum, having the horizon as its perimeter, cries are carried to the neighborhood of the river. The western horizon behind the ridge where the camp ends in inland, but southward from the high road, is a mist that seems to thunder. A heavy murmur resembling the rolling of ritualistic drums shakes the atmosphere. It is the outpost or investing belt of the, be of the Beelzebub threatening heaven from that direction, but at a distance of a hundred leagues composed of his resonant subjects. Occasionally, upon a long-winded blast, the frittered corpse of a mosquito may be born. As it strikes the heavenly soil, a small sanguine flame bursts up and is consumed or rescued. A dark ganglion of the bodies of anaphiles, mayflies, locusts, ephemerids will sometimes be hurled. Down upon the road, a whiff of the plague and splenic fever, the diabolic flame, and the nodal obscenity is gone. Is gone. With the gate of Cataphilus, some homing sol solitary shadow is continually arriving in the restless dust of the turnpike, challenged at the toll gate, thrown across it at the first milestone from the waterfront. Like black drops falling into a cistern, these slow but incessant forms feed the camp to overflowing. Where the highway terminates at the riverside is a ferry station. Facing this on the metropolitan shore is, to the right, the citadel, rising plumb from the water, a crown of silver rock, as florid towers, as florets towers arranged around its summit. At the ferry station there is a frail figure planted on the discolored stones facing the stream. Hatless, feet thrust into old leather slippers, the brown vamp prolonged up the instep by a, jip, uh, by a japaned tongue of black. It might be a morning in the breezy popular, sum, popular summer, a visitor halted on the quay of the holiday port to watch the early morning catch. Sandy gray hair and dejected spandles strays in rusty wisps. A thin rank mustache is pressed by the wind. Bearing first from one direction then another, back against the small self-possessed mouth, 
Shoulders high and studious, the right arm hugs as a paradoxical ally, a humble limb of nature, an oaken sapling, Wicklow bread. The suit of nondescript dark gray for ordinary daywear, day wear, well cut and a little shabby, is coquettishly tight and small on the trunk and limbs of a child, reaching up with a girlish hand to the stick cuddled under the miniature oxter, with the other hand the gla- that the glasses are shaded against the light, as the eyes follow the flight of a wild duck along the city walls northward, the knees slightly flexed to allow the body to move gracefully from the slender hips. Speculations as to the habitat uh, and sports status of the celestial waterfowl. Food? Fish fry frogs? Speculations as to fish life in these waters, lifeless they seem, more speculations involving chemistry of waters. A crowded punt is making inshore, as a spot fifty yards above the ferry. A band of swarthy peons disembark, carrying picks and spades. They enter a box-shaped skip, their backs forming a top-heavy wall above its sides. It begins moving inland upon its toy track. So this, this, see what I mean about the prose here, but this is just getting into the introduction of, uh, of, uh, of satyrs here. So um, I'll read a little bit more here. A long fisherman fidgets at the movement of the small observer, finally thrusting first one long booted leg and then another into its bark. A giant clog whose peaked toe wavers as he enters its shell. He walks off, wagging his buttocks as he churns the rudder paddle upon the rusty tide. An offended aquatic creature. A stone's throw out, he stops, faces the shore, studying somberly in perspective the man sparrow, who multiplies precise movements, an organism which in place of speech has evolved a peripatetic system of response to a dead environment. It has wandered beside the sticks, by this, it has wandered beside this sticks, a lost automaton rather than a lost soul. It has taken the measure of its universe. Man is the measure. It rears itself up, steadily confronts the moves uh, and moves along the shadows. A new voice hails him of an old friend, spanking noisily of opaque air at his back. The maternal warmth of early life gushes unexpectedly from a mouth open somewhere near him in the atmosphere. Pullman? I thought so. Well, I'll be damned. As the introduction from Satters to Pullman. Again, no chapters uh, through the book. And uh, that's just a little flavor of it. It gets into a lot of interesting philosophical themes that are uh, coherent later on in the book. I'll read a little bit more from later on here. So he pauses, dangling his pavetta as though it were a monocle. He watches with ferocious, pleased recognition a small bearded figure climbing with difficulty, for it is lame into the theater. Leering, he attends its ascent, notes ironically the histrionic swing of the cloak. With mock courtesy, attends until it is seated. At length, he withdraw- withdraws his eyes publicly, tempering the relish of his smile and, par- and pursues. Substance, quote, substance then, it is our aim to secure. But perhaps it may occur to you that my description of the especially concrete nature of what we seek to perpetuate precludes the idea of substance. I think that would be foolish, an effect of snobbery and the old deep-seated dualism which attached disgrace to physical nature. When we set out to look for substance, where else shall we find it but in the flesh? In the last analysis, is not substance itself flesh? As for the matter, those excellent contemporary philosophers have shown who confound flesh and spirit to the advantage of the former and of physical law, just as singularity was for William of Ockham the only true substance. Not that I recommend you Ockham. His razor is a two-edged implement and makes him a dangerous doctor for beginners. To return, there is no mind but the body, and there is no singularity but in that. Every step by which you remove yourself from it is a step towards the one. As we interpret it, that it, as we interpret it, that is towards nothingness. So to be unique, no one quite like us, that is the idea, is it not? And for the substantial uniqueness as well to be solid so that we can pinch it, pat it and poke it. That is, there you have, am I not right? The bottom of our desire? 
and it goes on. Um, there's one more little section here I wanted to read. All right, a little bit more here, and then we'll wrap up here. So the, uh, the voice roars out with consummate accent of a role constantly rehearsed. Quote, I use magician in the ordinary sense of illusionist, hypnotist, or technical trick performer. And whether your ostensible approach be that of mathematics, biology, medicine, epistemology, or moralistics is all one. Men find what they desire. You do not expect... You do not expect me, at least, to be superstitious about your profession, with your convex and concave mirrors and with your witch's cauldron, time into which you cast all the objects of sense, softening and confusing them in your quote-unquote futurist or time-obsessed alchemy. Are you not faithful to the traditions of the magician? Is your art, for all its mechanical subtlety, profounder than that of Protagoras, that it took the greatest intellect of the Greek world of all his time to confute? The kinked raven hair of the bailiff starts back furbundedly from his forehead. His ears cling sheepishly and flatten against his skull. His underlip is extruded and his eyes sparkling with the malice of battle dart hither and thither upon the faces of the audience, his cloud of witnesses. No verbal response comes from him at once. He plunges his little world into silence, an ambush full of mute gusto at its center. But he peeks his mouth, strokes his jutting chin as though it were bare, it was, as though it were a beard enclosed in the vanished in the varnished husk of a cartonage. Then, in his most piping and nasal voice of ex extreme complaint, starts off shrilly, quote, "This is my children is the way the day always begins. What am I to do? I implore you to tell me. I have protested against the method imposed on us here of free debate." It isn't that I mind discussing these matters. They are most interesting. I know not you, but to me they are. And as you are aware, I think I am all for freedom of speech, no one more so. Everything fair, square, and above board is my motto and always has been. Let God be my witness. I don't regard you as my clients, but as my friends. Let all opinion be ventilated. I'd rather see it that way. But it is your time I am thinking about. He wills, rolling his eyes about among them in startled gambles. It is your time, my poor children. He gazes at them in silent, passionate, protesting inquiry. Commiserative heads are shaken and wagged in chorus in time with his and scornful glances cast towards Hyperides. Quote, Many of you have waited months, some even years, some so long you have been ceased to know since when and have lost count of your turn to come. It is the cruel suspense. There is a type of discussion. I won't say what it is, for on no account would I do anything that could be interpreted as a discouragement of free speech, which is in fact entirely otois. It serves no possible purpose. What's more, it wastes a great deal of time. That is what I mean, the time that is it, see? It is the time that is the trouble, that is troubling all of us, of the time and the, wait, and the waiting and the rest of it. But the time, I enjoy it. The turning over the old things and finding new absurdities in them every day. All this time I'm turning over and over for my part, for my part I love it simply. This is a confession mind. But no one else gets anything out of it. I reproach myself, oh, more often than not. I know I am inclined to be a bit selfish in that respect. But I do realize that, first and foremost, I have to think of you that I do absolutely understand. Be just now that I do. Business first is our motto, gentlemen. Our customers are our friends. That's another. It's a new ideal of friendship, nothing less. The ideal of the modern age, I might almost say. So there, you are torn two ways, see? Duty and pleasure. Again, I ask you, is this place for all that hot air? Phew. He mops his brow. Not exactly. I'll leave it there because so I don't want to make this too long, but somehow in some way this prose and, and is um, compelling. And when I read this, I just want to keep reading and keep going. And even though it doesn't make sense in, in, a, in a, well, there's a lot of sense being made in a different way here. I find it fascinating and interesting. Would love to hear what you guys think. Um, 
and let me know if you want to hear more about Wyndham. Look into him yourself and um, let me know what you guys think. All right. So hope everybody's well. God bless and talk to you soon.